Good day to you. Overall, would you say that you live more in the natural world or would you say that you live more in the media world? Do you spend most of your time in surroundings like this? I'm standing in my front yard right now and actually in the background is East Stroudsburg University. That's how close I live to the university. And in my yard I have trees, I have flowers, I have green grass that I mow. It's a natural world, right? It's things growing around you. But of course, I don't live in that world all the time, just like you. I live in a world with vehicles. I've got a radio in that vehicle. I've got Bluetooth in that vehicle. I've got my cell phone when I travel around in that vehicle, giving me access to all kinds of things. I'm walking into my house now. I'm in a garage. A lot of people have televisions in their garages, at least if you're an old school father, so to speak. For sports, that's often what's going on there. But really throughout the house, people have, they don't even call them televisions, they call them monitors, right? You've got big screens, screens. You got in your family home, anyhow, you probably got two or three. You may even have one in the bathroom, one in the kitchen. And throughout your day, if you're not a TV watcher, you're probably looking at screens, you're looking at your phone, you're looking at your tablet. I got a TV right there, very typical. I mean, I put that TV right in the middle of the room. It's so important that I'm blocking my path for walking, right? That's very common. We arrange our family rooms with our TV sets first. Then we put our furniture in there. We'll even block a window to make room for our TVs. So the question remains, do you live more in a natural world or do you live more in a media world? And of course it's dependent upon the day, it's dependent upon the season. In winter, we tend to spend more time inside accessing more media. It depends on your mood. It depends on external events like a pandemic, which cause both people to go out into nature more often and also people to increase their streaming on Netflix and Amazon and all the rest of them. So what kind of world do you live in? Most of us live in a media world. It's impossible to avoid media. And so that's what we're focusing on today in our very first chapter. It's chapter one, living in a media world. We're going to cover that material, but before we do that, I just want to suggest to you that you get yourself in a good rhythm in this class, right? So for every class, you're going to be doing three things every single day, except for the first day where you're doing a fourth thing, commenting or asking a question about my CV. But every day you're going to be reading the book, you're going to be watching the instructor video, you're going to be taking your quiz, and you're going to be making your RSC post. That's four things. So as I go through, as I go through this material, you're going to want to have the email that I've sent out, which has links links to media content and concepts and graphics that will help explain what I'm about to talk about. I don't use PowerPoint. If you want to know why, you can read the column in my book, PowerPoint Presentations, What to Expect. You can read about that in Rounding Some Corners if you want to see why I don't use PowerPoint. It is on purpose. I use links, so you're going to want to have those links handy by your side as we go through the material. Now let's turn to the material. Let's talk about this media world that we're living in. It's like you're in an envelope, right? And the sides of the envelope are media. It's, it's impossible to escape. Even right now in this room, there are radio signals from all over Pennsylvania that are circulating in here with, without me even realizing. It's impossible really to escape media and unless you're camping or unless the lights go out or unless you're really, really sick. And even then you probably got your cell phone. So we're just always in that envelope with media surrounding us. So let's move now to talk about living in a media world. And the first thing that I want to do is get across a definition of one of the most important words in the whole class, and that is the word communication. And maybe all of us think we know what communication is, but do we really? What's the definition of it? I like the definition by George Gerbner, George Gerbner, the professor from the University of Pennsylvania who's cited in this book, George Gerbner says that communication is social interaction through messages. Social interaction through messages, I, I like that definition. It means that we use messages, including media messages like sending cell phone texts or posting on, on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, that we use those messages to cause people 
to interact with each other, to communicate, to exchange meaning. I think that's a fascinating definition. That's going to serve as our entry point to talk about talking about living in a media world because next we're going to move to different levels of communication of which mass communication is just one of the levels. And I've seen lots of different levels talked about in different classes and different books over the years. So you can add some if you want. But the basic ones that I want to cover, if we look at a, at a pyramid, at a triangle, at the very bottom level of communication, the very bottom one, the basic one, is intra-personal communication. Intra-personal communication, which is communication between yourself. It's in your head. As when you say, oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. I don't want to do that again. Or as if when you say, I'm going into an interview, this is what I want to make sure that I get across when I'm being asked questions. You're talking to yourself. You may not be saying the words out loud. You're communicating. You're, you're, you're visualizing and vocalizing the words to yourself and images too. That's intrapersonal communication that goes on inside of our heads. That's level one. Now we go to the next level. The next level is interpersonal communication. Interpersonal communication is Communication between two people. That's what it is. It's communication between two people, whether you're texting, whether you're on the phone, whether you're in an embrace on the couch. It's two people. And because it's two people, it's often very relational oriented. The two people that are looked at in this level are people who have a history with each other. They are family members or their boyfriend, girlfriend or father, daughter, etc. So very relational oriented. Now let's move on to the next level of communication, which is group communication. And by the way, these two last levels, we both have classes for in our department. We have interpersonal communication, CMSD 235, and we have group communication, which we're teaching this semester, the fall semester. It's CMSD 220, small group communication. That's three to 15 people. When we look at communication in small groups, we look at how groups function as a unit, where you'll have a leader, you'll have a person who speaks up a lot, you'll have somebody who's shy. We look at group communication in the context of teams, sports, committees, organizations. It's another level of communication. And then finally, we're still going up through the pyramid. The next level of communication is mass communication. It's mass communication, and that's what we're taking on in this course. Mass communication is defined by messages that are sent by technology, such as a television or a radio or a cell phone signal, messages sent by technology that are going to hundreds, thousands, and sometimes millions of anonymous people in different locations. So the people are anonymous because they don't know each other. If you're watching a football game on television, somebody else is watching the same game in Houston, Texas, you're not going to know them. You're in the same audience, though, but you're anonymous. And furthermore, they're watching it 2,000 miles away. They're in a different location. Those factors make mass communication technology, anonymous people, different locations make mass communication, mass media, very, very different. And those two words, by the way, are something else that I want to distinguish between what's the difference between mass communication and mass media. Mass communication is the act of communicating. It's the act of communicating to masses of people. Mass media are those media that produce the content that are then distributed to people. So mass media are going to be like NBC television or Fox Sports or CNN or Tumblr or Twitter. That's the mass media. All right, let's move on now to understanding this world that we're living in, understanding this world. And we have a term to describe that in our field. It's called media literacy. Media literacy is speaking about the idea that in order to make sense of this world that we live in, which is highly in, infused by mass media, we have to have a literacy for understanding mass media. You know, literacy, like learning how to read, you probably do it secondhand, even though reading is not something that people willingly mostly do today, but it, you don't think twice about it when you do it, right? It's because you've had so many years of learning how to read paragraphs, how to read chapters, how to read punctuation marks, how to construct sentences, that's literacy. So we need the same literacy to understand media. We need the same literacy to understand media. And we know that there are different dimensions to our understanding. There are different dimensions to what we need to figure out when we're trying to understand media. One dimension is that cognitive dimension. Cognitive dimension, anytime you hear that word, it has something to do with your thinking, with your brain, 
cognitive cognitive is thinking. So that thinking part of media is something that we need to understand. How do media get us to think? How does it? How do media, when they investigate, for example, a collapsed building, which happened a couple of weeks ago in Florida, how do media start to tell the story about that and get us to think about who's at fault? Was it because the owners of the building didn't pay to have repairs done because of all these assessment reports? Or is it more that it's just bad luck? Just bad luck. I mean, those are only two ways of thinking about that situation going to be influenced by how news reporters talk about that situation. So there's a cognitive dimension to media. We also know, secondly, that when we're looking at media literacy, we're looking at the emotional dimension of media as well, that there are feelings created by the media message. This is an area I'd like you to take a look at the link that I provided in the email, the very last link. I'm sorry, it's not in order there. The very last link that has a public service announcement. I want you to take a look at that link, and I want you to think about the feelings that come up. Do you have a feeling of empathy for the person who's starring in that public service announcement about anxiety and depression? Do you have that feeling of empathy? Media create feelings in us. Happiness, sadness, anxiety, suspense, thrill, sadness. I might have already said sadness. Envy, jealousy. Media create feelings in us. It's another area of literacy that we need to understand when we study media. Next up, as a level of, of uh, literacy, is aesthetic. The aesthetic dimension of media, which is to say media are beautiful. They are creative. They are pretty. I mean, you look at the way the Olympics are produced, pretty amazing. You look at the way a lot of Netflix shows start off with a song and then, you know, Shameless, for example, if you've watched Shameless, they always start with a, a, a teaser in the beginning that chides the audience for not watching Shameless the last week. You didn't watch Shameless last week? And then they go into a bunch of profanities. That, that's an artistic endeavor to do that at the beginning of the show to create that kind of um, common talk that you have on the street with somebody about a show that you might have missed. That's artistic. That's creative. It's another dimension. And then finally, there's a moral dimension of media. There's a moral dimension of media. I live in the Poconos in the summer and a lot of times, unfortunately, there are drownings in the Delaware River. And when the news media go out to cover the drownings, they never show the body being pulled out of the river. And that's because they don't want it to be offensive to people watching television in their home, eating meals. And also they don't want to get word out to family members who have not yet been notified. That's a moral decision. But are you really doing enough to stop drownings in the future if you don't show the body as it drowned in the river? Wouldn't it make more sense to show a body, even if it's a young boy or a young girl, to show the tragedy that can happen if you don't wear a life preserver, that if you don't take the currents seriously in the Delaware? That's a moral question. There's no right answer to moral questions, but media have a moral dimension. Now, the chapter goes into how you can develop media literacy. I'm going to let you look at that material on your own. There's a long list of it. I'll just mention one of them, and one of them is skepticism. Skepticism is doubting whether the way that you are seeing the media is really the whole story. That's what skepticism is. You have to look behind the media. And that's what this class is going to largely, hopefully, equip you with, is the tools after 15 weeks that you can see behind the film. You can see behind the web page. You can see behind the text message that you're getting. You see behind the streaming show that you're watching. You see this much larger world of media and what's interacting back there to create that content. And so you can read that material on your own, Developing Media Literacy. All right, next up, we're going to talk about models, models that describe the process of mass communication. We want to get a handle on what's happening when mass communication occurs, and there are different models to explain that, just like if you want to look at a giant airplane, like a 757, that's a big airplane, you can look at a little model in a store, and you can turn that model around, you can see the front of it, you can see the back of it, you can really get a good idea on what that plane looks like, whereas if you were to stand next to that plane, it's too big too complex. You can't see the other side while you're looking at one side. So we use models to help us understand bigger complex processes. And the first model to help us understand mass communication is the transmission model. The transmission model and, and the transmission model is a model that is depicted in a link that I've sent you. You can take a look at it and it's it's a model that you'll get in almost any basic communication class that you take. It's, it's It was actually developed by two telephone researchers and so it's got a, like an engineering component to it. So you've got a sender, you've got a receiver, you've got a channel, that's the 
what carries the message. You've got the message, which is separate from the channel. The channel could be a television. It could be a, a newspaper. It could be your cell phone. You've got the message. You've got then these two other processes, which may be new words to you, encoding and decoding. Encoding is when you decide to use symbols to express your thoughts. And the symbols that you're selecting are the characters that you're putting in a TV show, the graphics that you're putting in, the writing that's going on. Those are the symbols that you're selecting. That's encoding. You want to tell a story about two people who fell in love and one of them passed away and the other one's grieving. You can tell that story in many different ways. How you tell it is is how you encode it with the way that you tell that story. And then the back side of that is decoding. Decoding is where the receiver or the audience member is looking at the messages and they're trying to figure out whether they're getting the same understanding as a person who created it. Like a person may want to be creating a feeling when you're mourning somebody else, a feeling of, of re rejuvenation. Like you're going to take what they, they had in life and you're going to carry it on yourself. But the person receiving that message, maybe they just had somebody pass away in their family, so they read it differently. They're like, no, this is this is about regretting the loss of a person. Two different meanings. Decoding can be different from the encoding. And then finally, there's noise. That's another element that's in that transmission model, stuff that gets in the way. I've got an air conditioning uh, that's raring, roaring right now. I don't know if you can hear that. I don't know if that's in the way. I chose this background here. It's just a pine, knotty pine, so that there's not a lot of distraction when I'm delivering my, my videos. Noise can be in the way. All right, so that sums up the transmission model. It's an old model, 1950s. That's since been replaced by other models. Let's talk about them now. And these models, I have examples in my links that I've sent you online to just illustrate what might be a concrete example of these other models. So this next one is called the ritual model. The ritual model. And this is trying to understand how and why audiences communicate, sorry, how and why audiences consume media. Like what drives people to be on their phones late at night before they go to bed knowing, oh, I need, I got to get up early in the morning. Why aren't I in bed like yet? One more scroll. One more, oh wait, I haven't checked Twitter yet. One more. What causes people to do that? That's what the ritual model is out. It's trying to understand. And I've got a photograph there. Isn't it interesting? You, you won't think anything of it. It's a group of people who are on their cell phones. And yet they're all sitting at a table with the opportunity to speak with each other. But everybody's eyes are not on each other, but they're on their phones scrolling through. It's, it's become a ritual. And that kind of behavior is a way of breaking the ice, especially when you're around people that you're not used to being around. You break out your phone. You don't have to look somebody in the eye. You don't have to think about what you're going to say. You don't have to work as hard in the conversation. It's a ritual of getting together. Movies. Before the pandemic, anyhow, a lot of people went to movie theaters, especially in the summer. And movies are a way to introduce yourself to a potential romantic partner. You take a date to a movie, right? You can sit in the dark. You can get close to them. You can start to feel their vibe and everything. That's ritual, right? It's how we use media. All right, next up is the publicity model. The publicity model says that media are trying to draw attention to a person or a group. If you go to ESU's webpage, I'm sure every one of you have been on that page multiple times. Many of you probably were on it before you chose ESU. It's trying to promote ESU. It's trying to get you interested. You know, you can decide for yourself whether it did a good job of that, but that's what publicity uh, mass media do, or mass media, I should say, looked at from a publicity vantage point. They're trying to draw attention. That's what people do when they have protests. You want to protest? You want to protest the election? You want protest COVID, you protest uh, GLBT, whatever you want to protest, you hold a big group in a big space, you invite the media and you're trying to draw attention. It's a publicity model. So for the publicity model, I've got the ESU webpage. You can take a look there, there in, the, in the links. And then finally, we have the reception model. The reception model focuses more on the audience, on the receivers, and it looks how people create meaning. Looks how people create meaning. There's a film that's going around that was going around since I was in high school called The Rocky Horror Picture Show. The Rocky Horror Picture Show. It came out as a Halloween horror movie. It soon became an anthem for the audience to go to movie theaters and act out what the people were going to say in their lines by asking questions. And then when the film has a character saying their line, they're answering the question. So you may know about this film. It's taken on a whole completely different life. People who go to it, they dress up. They are Rocky Horror Picture Show 
fans. There is meaning that is created out of that that is unique to those fans. And we can say the same thing for sports fans. I watched a Phillies game not too long ago, and they got cream. They were winning, and then they lost big in the ninth inning, which was how they lost several days before. And it's like all the Phillies fans I know are talking about the same thing. The bullpen, the bullpen, the bullpen. They just can't hold a lead. They they give up. Reception analysis focuses on the meaning that people get from the experience. Video gamers, video gamers, they play together. They call out to each other even though they're not in the same room. They feel triumph when they win. They feel loss when they lose. Meaning comes from the reception model by looking at the audience. So now we're going to go to the final part of today's lecture, and it's going to talk about how mass media have evolved in the United States and really across the world. And this little section here is meant to be a preview of where we're going in the rest of the course. I do have a video that's for you in the link. It's called A Brief History of Mass Media. It's a little bit different from the material I'm going to talk about, but I think it's a really fine capture of how mass media have developed over time. And it's got great a music soundtrack to it. And it really captures, I think, the feeling of how fast the acceleration of mass media has truly gone since the very first invention that we had, which who knows when that was. You could say it was smoke signals from Native Americans living in the Poconos, or you could say it was African tribes hitting their drums to let the, the next village know that they just killed a gazelle and there's extra meat. It could be that, or it could be when you look at the printing press. It's going to be up to you to decide, but take a look at that brief history, and now let me finish out with the material for today's class. So if we look at different periods in the development of mass media. The first period we're going to look at are the pre-mass media networks, pre-mass media, before there were any mass media, which we're going to define in a moment. So how is how did communication take place? How was it spread to lots of people? That's what we're trying to understand here. When there were no no television, no cell phones, we are talking about we're talking about ancient Greece and ancient Rome. BC, that's what we're talking about. And one of the biggest ways that communication was spread was through the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, I've got a graphic for you there you can look at. Look at how big that territory was. It was all around Europe. Roman Catholic Church and its network of, of uh, cathedrals and priests and bishops. All these people spreading information about the Catholic Church is one of the first ways that information was spread. And then also still in the pre-mass media network, we also had storytellers. Storytellers, usually an elderly person in the house, an uncle, a grandfather, a father, a person who had traveled, had been to the new world and back. These people come back and they tell stories about what they've seen, right? It's no different today. You go down the shore and you come back, somebody hasn't been able to go to the shore and you tell the story of the the fish that washed up on the beach or you tell the story of how good the lobster roll or the saltwater taffy you're telling stories that's how information was spread but in society we typically had a person in each family who was sort of the designated storyteller the uncle the wise uncle etc and then also as a pre-mass media network we have music music some musicians depicted there before we had electric instruments and, and amplifiers and all that stuff it, People played music and they were singing songs and songs are containing messages and, and row, row, row your boat. How old is that? That's an old song, right? That's how messages were communicated through storytellers. Okay, but all of this changes with the very first, what we consider to be major mass media invention, and that's in, 14, in the 1450s. In the 1450s, we get the printing press. We're going to talk about the printing press. We have a whole chapter dedicated to it, but it basically allowed for the production of the book production of newspapers, the production of magazines, and it allowed like factory production of these things. That's when we get the ability to send out messages to a lot of people and to create the messages very quickly. Although creating a book is not that quick, but compared to storytellers, it was very, very quick. After that, after print in the 1900s, then we get electronic media. It started with the telegraph, the dee 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 used at train stations, and then it went to radio, and then television, and, and then it eventually paved the way for the next phase. So we've got pre-mass media networks, we've got the print stage, then we've got the electronic network stage. And now we come to the internet stage. That's the era that we're in right now. And what's defining our stage in the development of mass media living this era is the interactivity of our internet communication. The interactivity of it, the fact that you can tweet stars and get a response. The fact that you can 
text a, a phone number during a show like Dancing with the Stars on television and a contestant may be voted off because of you. The fact that you can post your own YouTube videos on your own channel and people can comment on those and people do comment on those. It's all part of the world that we're living in which is which has been transformed radically from the previous world of just electronic radio and TV. Now we have the internet world. The internet world involves interactivity and social media are propelling the interactivity because there are so many different ways that you can respond on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. It's all designed to get people to interact. That's the era that we're living in. And social media and legacy media, those are media that came before social media, TV, radio, film, newspapers, they're continuing to interact with each other and evolve, right? As they, as they develop their own digital media platforms, legacy media do, and as, as big companies like Google purchase YouTube and get into video. So there's a lot going on in our era, era of interactivity. The book does finish with seven truths about mass media. I'm going to let you read those on your own. Decide for yourself whether those truths are in fact truths. So this is going to wrap up our first chapter. Chapter one, we are living in a media world, are we not?